So as Belinda said, my name is Claire Collins. I'm a third year student at the University of Michigan Law School. And I just wanted to thank you for coming today. I'm really excited to share this exciting um, project with you and something that we've been working on for almost a year now. And the project that we're working on or the program we're trying to implement is called Resiliency Court. And it's designed to be a specialty child welfare docket that we're trying to implement in Washtenaw County and specifically for parents and children that are involved in the child welfare system. Oh, I have to, there we go. So this project initially emerged from what was called a problem solving initiative course at the University of Michigan Law School. And the law school has been um, trying to involve students more in inter interdisciplinary um, environments where they're presented with a problem and then it's the, the, the task of the um, class is to design a solution to this problem. And so I was involved in one of these courses with social work students, public health students, public policy students, and also some med students. And um, as you can see, these are the initial partners on the project. And then Vivek Sankaran, who is the director of the Child Advocacy Law Clinic at the law school, he was one of the professors overseeing this course, as well as Bridget Carr, who was the director of the Human Trafficking Clinic at the law school. And throughout this project, we've also been having a lot of conversations with Judge Connors and Referee Butterwick, who oversee um, and preside over the Washtenaw County Juvenile Court. And so they're very interested in this program and also open to implementing it in Washtenaw County. So the problem that we were presented with in this course you is, have to have to oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And if you can't see, please let me know. Um, but the problem that we were presented with in this course was the inability of child welfare systems to recognize trauma and victimization in parents hinders their ability to improve family safety by identifying and directly addressing an individual family's unique needs. So why is this such a significant problem? First of all, parents often are not identified as victims or as having a trauma history. There's several parents within the child welfare system, even in Washtenaw County, who've been victims of human trafficking, victims of domestic violence, or have themselves experienced abuse and neglect as children. And oftentimes, this trauma from these experiences is not recognized. And moreover, the, the court system, and sometimes DHHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, they're not trauma-informed, which means they're not sensitive to how trauma really affects um, these parents' lives and how it affects their parenting ability. And moreover, they don't directly acknowledge that being involved in child welfare can actually re-traumatize parents. And in doing so, that kind of inhibits them from succeeding in their service plan um, within the child welfare system. So as a consequence of not identifying parents as victims or addressing their trauma history, we're unable to really provide them with services that can directly address their needs and help them overcome whatever is preventing them from safely caring for their children. And since we're not able to provide them with services that directly address their trauma, this significantly reduces the likelihood of them being reunified with their children. So it's definitely a significant problem um, that's not currently being addressed as robustly as it should. So what do I mean by complex trauma? Where this court specifically is focused on parents with complex trauma. It refers to both um, the exposure to various types of trauma or multiple severe traumatic events and also various long-term effects of that traumatic experience. Um, and also, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, don't hesitate to ask. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep... Okay. Can you repeat the name of the uh, professor, law professor with the juvenile court? Yep. Professor Vivek Sankaran. Thank you. Yep. And he's the director of the Child Advocacy Law Clinic. So in order to think, oh yes, of course. This was, yeah. yep. This is what I was talking about with parents not being identified. <clears throat> um, systems are not trauma informed, and then as a result, um, parents are not connected to services that can directly address and help them overcome their trauma. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Um, this is the result of the first several years of study by this um, group you've been in, or where did this? these conclusions come from? So this um, was a result of it's the problem solving initiative course at Michigan Law School and that was that was held last spring so about a year ago. Yeah. Okay so I'm thinking about complex trauma it's helpful to think about how how we react to stressful situations and there's three categories of stress that social science literature has identified. The first is what they call a positive stress response, and this is, if 
I don't know, you're trying to complete a project on time and you're close to a deadline and you begin to feel stressed, or you're about to experience something new and maybe your body has some sort of stress response. And this is something that we've all experienced before. But usually when we experience this type of stress after we've turned in that project close to the deadline or have had that new experience, usually our bodies kind of return to a normal state. So like no longer is our heart beat, heart elevated, our stress hormones return to normal. So we, are, we easily recover from these stress responses. A second type of stress, which is a little more severe, is what they call a tolerable stress response. And this would be a situation in which maybe you were in a car accident or experienced the death of a parent or a close relative. And that, and in that event, there's greater activation of the body's alert systems. But usually with some community and social support, people most people are able to overcome that stress and also kind of return to a normal stress level. But when we talk about complex trauma, we're referring to a, what they call a toxic stress response. And this is an event in which a, per, a person um, experiences very severe or frequent traumatic events and their body does not recover. And as a result, it actually changes the architecture of their brain and how their brain perceives the world around them. Um, and, and it also has long-term effects on the person's um, health, health outcomes and well-being. I mean, let me just check something. Yes. Um, so was there any consideration of complex trauma to PTSD, which is more familiar? Yes, that, that's an example of something that emerges when people do not recover from complex trauma is post-traumatic stress disorder. Are they saying it's one and the same? Yes. Yeah, post-traumatic stress disorder emerges after a person has experienced this complex trauma and has not recovered. And that's kind of how the body reacts to that trauma, or one way in which it could react to that trauma. So what you're saying, the broader thing is the complex trauma. Sometimes people react with PTSD, mm -hmm. and sometimes it might show otherwise. Right, right. Yes, it can manifest itself in um, several ways, but post-traumatic stress disorder is definitely a way in which the body reacts to having this complex trauma. Okay, so one way of measuring complex trauma, and this is kind of the basis for our program, it's called Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs. And ACEs refer to a range of negative events that one experiences during childhood that can elicit this traumatic or chronic stress response. And common ACEs include child abuse and neglect, witnessing domestic violence, living in a household with substance abuse or mental illness, um, death of a parent, or an incarcerated parent. And so the 1998 ACEs study, actually let me go to the next slide. Oh, and a high, high ACE score can indicate the presence of complex trauma. So this is kind of the measurement that we're using um, in implementing our program. So the 1998 ACEs study, which was the first study conducted on adverse childhood experiences, um, found a relationship between a person's ACE score and the number of high-risk behaviors or poor health outcomes across the person's lifespan. So, the pe so people with high ACE scores were more likely to experience mental illness or struggle with substance abuse. There was higher involvement or likelihood of involvement in criminal and child welfare courts and they were more likely to develop chronic disease, such as heart disease, depression, and, there's, and they had a higher likelihood of suicide. So they discovered that this early childhood trauma does have lasting impacts on one's brain development, but also on one's physiology. And so they concluded that exposure to traumatic events, especially in childhood, does disrupt brain development and can cause functional differences in learning behaviors and health. And these have lasting effects across the lifespan. But luckily, there is hope, which is re resiliency. And there's been a lot of, oh, you have a question? Okay. Um, there's been a lot of um, studies that have emerged within the social science literature that has demonstrated that resiliency or building resilience factors in one's life can mitigate the impact of ACEs and help improve health outcomes for people who have had several of these early child, adverse childhood experiences. And they define resiliency as a set of assets or resources which people can call upon to insulate them against or rebound from adverse life experiences. So very similar to what we were talking about earlier when we think of resiliency. And something that's also important, and this was something touched on in our first discussion, is that resilience is not like a characteristic that you're either born with and you have or you don't have. They've actually discovered that resiliency is something that can be learned over time. 
And so our court is designed to help parents rebuild their resiliency and also to enhance and rebuild resiliency factors within their lives in order to equip them to safely parent their children. So when we think of resiliency, the literature kind of discusses it in terms of resiliency factors. And they've identified three categories of these factors. So these are some examples of resiliency factors that our court hopes to reinforce with these families. So examples of individual factors include internal locus of control, which means I have some control over what happens to me in my environment. Self-efficacy, which is the belief that I can succeed in these tasks before me. Effective coping skills, I'll be able to cope with or manage whatever comes my way. Increased education skills and training, which refers to services or resources that are provided for these parents. Family factors include family cohesion, supportive parent-child interaction, social support, and adequate housing. And some community factors um, include involvement in the community, peer, peer acceptance, and supportive mentors. So as we kind of go through the resi resiliency court model, we can keep these factors in mind and kind of see how they are reinforced through resiliency court. So because re re rebuilding resiliency is so crucial to helping these parents overcome their trauma in order to equip them to safely care for their children, we designed a court model that has a mission of enhancing child safety by recognizing this complex trauma and victimization and then rebuilding their resiliency. And there's four components of our resiliency court model. The first is identification. The second is a specialty court docket. The third is a, a team, a dedicated services team that works with these parents and designs a tailored service plan. And then also evaluation so we can determine that our program is actually helping the participants within it. Could you double check? Um, court docket, could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So resiliency court is going to be a specialty docket within the child welfare court system. So the families that are dedicated to this docket will work with a specific services team and they'll have a kind of a different path through the court process as opposed to the traditional child welfare model. So because it is in, within the court system, there will still have to be a court record um, documenting all the major decisions that are made or legal decisions that are made. But there is an, a measure of confidentiality, especially within um, the case conferences, which is something I will discuss later. And then there's always attorney-client privilege as well. well. You mentioned the word docket. Yeah. The docket is the list of the names of the people who come into that court. So that part is public. Yes, and that's how it is within the current system as well. So you were saying that before, <laughs> when kids are uh, taken away from or in foster care, mm -hmm. and the parents are often treated as criminals, people who are not safe parents for the children. So this mm -hmm. would be looking at them as right. also people right. who, who need help. And, right. Yeah. Yes. And their names are published anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, in the dockets and everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we're recognizing that a lot of these um, parents within the system have also experienced abuse and neglect themselves, and this has affected their ability to care for their own children. And so we're trying to kind of break this intergenerational cycle of trauma. So the first part of our program is the identification piece. So when a parent enters the child welfare system today, the parent will not be screened <coughs> for trauma history and usually will not be screened for any sort of human trafficking or um, other types of victimization. But in our court, we're envisioning that all parent respondents will be screened for adverse childhood experiences to determine whether they have some sort of trauma history. And they will be screened by their attorneys. So we're hoping that all parent attorneys will implement what we call um, the ACE, ACEs scale screening tool, which is just a series of questions designed to ascertain if the parent has, um, has had any adverse childhood experiences. And then we'll be able to get a good idea of whether this parent does have, is struggling with some sort of complex trauma. And then based on each parent's ACE score, they can be selected to participate in our resiliency court program. Is the scoring on a scale of one to 10 or? Yes, the way, so they, 
in the original study, they identified 10 adverse childhood experiences, which they used to um, measure these parents' complex trauma. And most of the ACE scales still implement a series of 10 questions that a person <coughs> can ask a parent to determine or ascertain their trauma history. So going back to the, uh, the privacy issue, mm -hmm. that is done by an attorney, so that's that's privileged information, it's not going to be published anywhere? That's no. Right. Basically what will come out of that is just a number, 1 through 10, or 0 through 10, of the number of ACEs the person has had, but they it, will not, it won't be published, the source of those adverse childhood experiences. But the number itself will be published, it will be part of the record? I don't know. I don't think it will be part of the record, but it will just be part of kind of the screening process for determining who participates in resiliency court. But I, as far as I know, that that number on the ACEs scale will not be made public. Is there any training for the attorneys? So we are actually hoping um, through, well, part of what we're doing now is looking for funding sources and grants, and we're, we're requesting funding for um, trainings for all of the attorneys so they understand have an understanding of trauma, what it means to be trauma informed, and also ACEs and how to implement the screening tool. So I was going to ask the same thing about the training for mm -hmm. the, for the um, uh, attorneys because it seems like these um, parents are going to be very, um, their trust scale mm -hmm. will be, um, I Absolutely. mean, for them to open up and, and <clears throat> answer those questions fully, and, um, <clears throat> it seems like challenge. Yeah, and that's definitely something that we are considering. So we're hoping to find a way through um, attorneys being trauma-informed and then of course through their inter initial interview process with their clients that they're able to get some idea um, of the number of ACEs that a parent has. But that's definitely a good consideration. And it seems to me since all, uh, all the um, cases will be screened, mm -hmm. then um, takes away some of the mm -hmm. um, uh, stigma. stigma. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's something else, that that's another objective that we have um, in this docket, is to take away that stigma that some parents experience, because that's another um, factor that kind of inhibits them from really succeeding within the child welfare system. So. Will all parents be screened, or this is a request with their attorneys, and if so, what is in it for the attorney? Why would the attorneys start the screening? Absolutely. So we're yes, we would like all parents to be screened, and another an, another reason why we are requesting that, which I will talk about later, is that it will better enable other service providers to directly address the parents' trauma and connect them with services that will address their trauma. Um, and there is an advantage for. Um, the clients who are screened into resiliency court because they'll have a must, much more robust support structure and also more opportunities to receive services that will um, ad address their trauma. But the person who's making the decision whether or not to screen, is that the attorney or the client? The attorney. So but what we, is it in for the attorney to make that decision? So it will be better for their client if they are, if their trauma is recognized and they're able to receive better services and if they're able to participate in this program. Mm -hmm. Has any of this been piloted? No, we're hoping to pilot this in Washtenaw County. And this is actually the proposal for the pilot program. Would this be the first pilot, to your knowledge, like yes. this in Michigan? In Michigan, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in other states? There, according to Judge Connors, there are, I think Washington has what they call a resiliency court, but it's not, it's not identical to what we're proposing. So and there are trauma-informed courts all over the country. Yes. And particularly in mm -hmm. the... Chocolate children's area. Are they yeah, similar? similar? I'm sorry? Do they sound similar to this? They're based on this, mm -hmm. but they, some of them have actually, is it okay if I? I'll oh, go ahead. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of them have actually changed the courtrooms, mm -hmm. changed the courthouse, mm -hmm. um, understanding that some people react to just the way that a room is set up mm -hmm. or the way that a building is. And so <coughs> some of the courts have changed not just the way that they operate, but the uh, the whole environment that they ask people to come into. And can I add? Yeah. Um, I think um, it seems to be this new trend uh, coming across the country for child protection cases. Courts are taking a step back and saying, what do we need to do to adjust 
to better serve families if in fact we want to reunify them and send these kids home to a healthy and safe environment and not have them come back to court later mm -hmm. down the line. So um, I've been here in, just in, in our involvement with that docket, even though it's a very slow, uh, low <clears throat> scale, this is all I've been hearing about for the last two or three years. Courts uh, doing their own self-assessment and saying, what can we do? Is it a specialty docket? Um, the fact that she starts the presentation by saying that the major department that removes the kid, Department of Health and Human Services, the staff are not trauma informed. Mm -hmm. That is a huge, I mean, when I heard that, I, you know, I could have, anyway, I, I was upset. Um, the people who remove, who makes the determination that the child is not safe, has the right to move, remove my kid from my house, has no training, experience, learning on trauma. So how do they assess me to determine if I am a good parent or not, or I should pat my kid back? Although that explains a lot. It yeah. explains a lot. It explains a lot. It does. But, but the idea that, you know, and I guess the silver, you know, the light in, in this tunnel has, is becoming, for me, and I have a very hard, rigid stance with Department of Health and Human Service, so I am the agitator um, on purpose, is that they're at least taking a step back and doing that self-assessment. We don't know. So how do we get to this without going through these other paths of learning so that we can do a better job with this particular caseload? So yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's bittersweet for me. Yeah. But but it go but yeah, Washington is what I've heard. Oh yeah, Washington. In Wayne County is doing some things different mm -hmm. with their oh, that's yeah, right. yeah. I mean I, I won't take away from this presentation, but they're doing three or four new things uh, with their um, families and the child protection. There's thing. a famous court in, I think in Tucson and Arizona, there's one in Florida that's really mm -hmm. done a lot. Yeah. And I would suspect it starts with a judge rather than the legislative process. Yes, mm -hmm. I would say so. Huh? Yeah, that's true here too. With Judge Connors, this is something he's been really passionate about, and as I said, the past couple of years is this concept of resiliency. So, um, and as you were saying, I think DHHS they do receive trauma training, but something that's not implemented is this thinking of parents as victims themselves mm -hmm. or as experiencing this trauma themselves. And that's we actually when we did the problem solving initiative course the then director of the Department of Health and Human Services was one of our advisors and he said we would almost have to have a paradigm shift within the department mm -hmm. in order to be thinking about parents in this way. Because so. they're labeled as criminals. They are on the offenders. I mean, they have a hard time doing things that any someone you imagine with housing jobs and all of that. It comes up in their background check as a in their criminal history. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, when we don't directly address that trauma, we aren't really addressing the underlying issue that caused these children to be removed in the first place, and we're substantially decreasing the likelihood of them being returned. So that's why it's so important to acknowledge that this is a factor within these cases. So after parents are screened into our specialty, specialty court docket, they will be part of what we're calling resiliency court. And the goal of the specialty docket is to create a court environment that is uniquely equipped to meet the needs of, of families affected by complex trauma. And there's multiple components of our docket that's different from the traditional child welfare system. First, we're employing what we're calling case conferences. And this is also a new concept that's kind of been emerging within family courts. And similar to what you were saying, rather than hashing out legal issues within the courtroom or just among attorneys, which is usually what happens, um, case conferences will be within a conference room around a round table um, with the, all the parties present, with maybe the exception of the children, the attorneys, um, the, the manager for resiliency court, the foster care worker, and any interested service providers. And this provides an opportunity for everyone in the case to voice their opinion um, and be heard. And it also gives parents a chance to have some agency in these decisions that deeply affect their children. Unfortunately, in my experience, parents are often left out of these big decision-making processes, which really disempowers them. The second component um, are parent partners, and this is also an ongoing program in Washtenaw County that we're going to implement or include in Resiliency Court. So the parent partner program is currently implemented by the Judson Center, which is a service provider um, for children and families in Southeast Michigan. 
and parent partners are um, adults who, have, who, who themselves have been through the child welfare process, but they've been successfully reunified with their children. And under the current program, these parent partners are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they do provide a lot of support and mentorship for these parents. And they're also available to clarify any sort of confusion in the process. Often, for anyone who's never been involved in the child welfare system, it is very complex and often parents don't really understand what the process looks like or um, how it works. And so parent partners will also kind of clear up and clarify any confusion for parents. And is that a paid, paid position or is this all volunteer? They are paid. Yeah, yeah. Their staff of Judson Center mm -hmm. currently. Okay. Yes. And parent partners has gone on for how long? I think it's been about a year. It's been just a year. Yeah, Johnson Center uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services provided the grant dollars for the Judson Center to execute parent partners. Mm -hmm. So our Judson Center, in, which is not far from here actually, they have a program here in Wayne County, Genesee County, I think in mm -hmm. Macomb County, has a parent partner program set up, all funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. Is there any data coming back on health um, that I don't know. Um, so the group in um, Washington County has just been up and going for one year. Um, but I think the other counties have had a little bit more history, but I don't know about any of the data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the idea behind going back to our resiliency factors that we discussed earlier, one of the thoughts behind the Parent Partner Program is that it provides that mentorship and peer support and social support, which are key resiliency factors. Um, and so that's just another way of supporting and empowering these parents that are involved in this process. And so the third component of the specialized, especially court docket, would be what we're calling resiliency court days. Under the current system, cases are reviewed by the court every 90 days, um, and that's required by law. But under our system, they would be reviewed every 30 days on resiliency court days. And by reviewing these cases more frequently, it just allows the judges to have a better understanding of what's going on in the family and are better able to respond to any unmet needs. Furthermore, um, these days will we have, we'll have what we call trauma-informed court protocols. And just two, two examples of how the court can be more trauma-informed is um, oftentimes, I, Judge Connors and Referee Butterwick, are, they, since they do know a lot about trauma, I have no, I've never seen this in the, their courtroom. Um, but in other experiences I've had, often judges will be kind of coercive in how they interact with parents. So they'll say, well, you didn't complete these services or you didn't attend these visits. So I'm going to decrease the number of visits you have with your children in like the next couple months. Or you didn't complete this service, th this service, so we're not going to do unsupervised visits. We're going to have to do supervised visits. And the problem with that um, language or interaction is that that's actually characteristic of a lot of abusive relationships that some of these parents could be involved in. So, for example, parents involved in human trafficking, that's often how their traffickers control them, is by threatening to withhold, um, <coughs> I don't know, any necessities they need if they don't perform what the trafficker is asking of them. Or even in um, con power and control, um, domestic violence type relationships, that's also often very coercive. So, yes? In the case conferences, is there a place there for school representative to sort of be a liaison? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, if the, if the child is receiving services at school, there's it's definitely an opportunity for them to be involved. Involved as yep. part of a case conference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who's present at the review hearings? So the review hearings will be all the parties, um, maybe the children, depending on whether it would be healthy for them to be there, the attorneys, um, the foster care worker, the resiliency court manager, who's the person overseeing the whole um, program, and then also any interested service providers, and the judge, of course. So that's, and that's usually who's present at the, currently, at review hearings. And the purpose of the formal hearing is just to put on the record any decisions that were made during the case conferences. But the, the main decision-making process and conversation will be occurring during the case conference as opposed to in a courtroom in front of a judge. So are you going to talk about the trauma-informed court protocols? Oh, are? yes, that's what I was talking about now. Um, so, so one example would be um, having a trauma-informed view of how the court's relationship with a parent can actually serve to re-traumatize them. So not um, using that coercive um, tactic to, to 
motivate parents to complete their treatment plans <laughs> or to attend visits with their children. And then another um, aspect would be incorporating a more strengths-based script into hearings. So often in court hearings, judges are mostly focused on all of the negative things um, that are involved with the family. So they'll say you haven't attended this many visits, you haven't completed this service, um, you haven't, I don't know, attended this family team meeting. But rather than focusing on the negative, we're hoping courts will focus more on the positive aspects and kind of look for solutions to better help parents um, accomplish maybe some of the services that they haven't been um, up to that point. So being more strengths-based rather than focusing on the negatives. And again, that just serves to kind of empower parents and encourage them to continue working with their service plan. Uh, yes. a comment. Have you considered that that approach might be more successful in all Family cases? Oh, absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the ideal is that this applies to everybody, not just the resiliency core parents. But that was another problem that we identified in the current system that we're hoping to um, correct or improve through resiliency core. Well, and you've also found that sometimes the reason they haven't complied with the visits or the training or whatever they're supposed to do, they haven't complied with is because they're job is it oh, yeah. in a conflict or they don't have transportation yeah. or the buses stop running when it's scheduled and so asking more questions right. rather than just putting out the negatives. Right. It reminds me of the school program that we were doing going into um, you know going in and speaking with the parents and the in the principal and everything and the parent about why the kid isn't their child isn't making it to school and you know instead of saying you know, you've missed all this time and, and your kid's going to get suspended. It's like, well, what can we do to help you get, right. get your right. kid here? Absolutely. And then you find out, you know, the parent's working night shift, doesn't get, you know, gets stuck over time, mm -hmm. and can't get home to get the child to school. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it takes a village out, is there any value for grandparenting involved? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And yeah, grand grandparents are wonderful in the child welfare system. And they can be brought into it. Oh, yes, definitely. Yep. It's always great if um, children are removed, if they can be placed with a relative. Right. And a lot of times they are placed with their grandparents. Mm -hmm. So this, these, I think what excites me about this pilot project, and a small, it's going to be a smaller project that's just being piloted, is the, the hopefulness I have around systemic change. Mm -hmm. um, this is not necessarily the resiliency court, but one of the changes in Wayne County that was made around visitation, the Department of Health and Human Services says we can only provide visitations within this framework of time because they have to have staff who are super trained to supervise the visits. Well, if having visits with the children is meaningful for reunification, then how did you push those boundaries to increase capacity around visits? Well, they, kind of, they have included a large church in Detroit where grandparents are trained to supervise visits. Now, the risk is that they can be called to court and testify, but they're holding visits in a non-institutional setting uh, at a church where they've set up rooms with toys and you know games and all these family-friendly atmosphere. Um, that's been going on for maybe six to eight months, so I'm hopeful. But that's just one example of how this kind of work has to be done in order to create that thinking outside the box that our institutionals just don't have. So, yeah. So, scripts base is one. You yeah. know, I think, you know, the hearings that we have set in just to prepare to do what we're doing, it was all about how bad these parents are. Mm -hmm. And that's how parent partners became important mm -hmm. because the parent typically doesn't have a relative or a friend in, at the hearing mm -hmm. with them. And you're just hearing all of these horrible, I mean, horrible stories that builds a case to keep to terminate their rights. Um, and so, going going back to our the characteristics of this specialized court docket, the last one that I noted <laughs> were, if you can see it, the same personnel will be present at each hearing. And as you were saying, often people who have experienced this complex trauma do have trouble um, trusting people and being in trusting relationships. And so having that consistency in personnel is also very important for them, um, just to give them support through the complex trauma that they're suffering from. And so the last significant piece is the, um, let's see, so yeah, 
the services team that will be working with these parents as part of this program. And so there will be um, two people that are the main um, personnel on the services team, which is the resiliency court manager, and then there will be a foster care worker that is specifically dedicated to resiliency, working with resiliency court families. And the resiliency court manager is tasked with overseeing um, the whole court and it's ensuring that all of the administrative tasks are complete. But they also work with parents to resolve barriers um, to completing services or that are impeding their success. So one example would be ensuring that they have adequate transportation to their service providers or to, or, or to court. Um, and secondly, the private foster care worker will also, as I said, be dedicated to resiliency court and will work with the resiliency court manager to compose an individualized service plan for each family. So this is, this is very typical of what should happen um, in the current system, but sometimes isn't happening to the extent necessary to really help the families within the child welfare system. But this services team will first conduct a needs assessment, so they'll do a deeper evaluation of the parent's trauma history and also discover what are the sources of that trauma, because that could also be key to connecting them with services that will actually help them overcome their traumatic experiences. They will design an individualized service plan, which is something that already, already happens within the current system, um, but it'll be based on this needs, more um, robust needs assessment. And they'll be able to connect parents with appropriate services in the community that can specifically address the underlying trauma that they experience. And two aspects of the services piece that parents will participate in are monthly resiliency team meetings, which is an opportunity for the foster care worker, the resiliency court manager, the parent, and any service providers to get together and kind of assess how the parent is doing with their treatment plan, if there are any unmet needs, or if there are any barriers that the parent is experiencing to completing their services. And that's just a good way to kind of check in with the parents, um, set goals for the upcoming month, and just to ensure that they're receiving what they need um, to succeed within the child welfare system. Um, and finally, there will be weekly peer support meetings. And with this we, peer support model, we're envisioning that all the parents in resiliency court can get together once a week and share their experiences and support and kind of encourage each other through this process. And that, um, going back to the resiliency factors, that would really inc um, include the peer support um, and community support that's very crucial to rebuilding resiliency. So those are all the components of our program. And we're hoping to implement a pilot program within Washtenaw County, hopefully within the next year and a half or so, that would involve 12 to 14 families, which is the typical caseload. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. 12 to 14 families, which is the typical caseload of a foster care worker. And the docket would be heard by Judge Connors and referee Butterwick. And we're hoping to implement this as soon as we're able to obtain funding and hire the necessary staff to implement this program. And partners that we're currently having conversations with are the Judson Center, um, the Dispute Resolution Center, and then also the parent attorneys. And we're hoping to make a similar presentation to them at some point this year. What's the Dispute Resolution Center's involvement? That's a great question. The, the case conference. Those are facilitated meetings, um, so that's as I, what I understand now, that is an appropriate space for us. Some of these cases might be referred to peacemaking because there is a problem that needs to be worked on in more of a peacemaking approach. The case conferences is a meeting among all of the stakeholders of the case that is facilitated by, that can be facilitated by any of us. Yeah, and that's something I should have been more clear oh, with yeah, earlier. Okay. I, I thought we would bring it up at the end. Oh, yeah. Um, but those are facilitated discussions that we would <coughs> yeah, yeah. love for you to be involved in. Are, are the other judges in the district aware of this program? That's a good question. I, I'm sure Judge Connors has shared this with some people, um, but since he's the main judge presiding over the juvenile um, child welfare docket, he's the only person that we've been having discussions with. <coughs> a wonderful one-page summary of this, oh, yeah. and I was going to print it out and bring it, and I haven't done that yet, That's so okay. I'm going to go read right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we made a one-page summary um, for you, in case you want to review this or read more about it later. This is a very exciting and oh, thank you. inspirational idea. <coughs> uh, it would certainly be helpful. <coughs> excuse me. It would certainly be helpful for 
a number of parents who might choose it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking of mothers of uh, <coughs> children who are in the juvenile court. Mm -hmm. Now they're not, they're not in the extreme situation of a court-ordered mandated situation, right. but uh, it would be wonderful if there were an option mm -hmm. for that to be made available. I think. Absolutely. I think Judge Connors is actually envisioning implementing some of this in um, the juvenile justice setting as well. So I think that's kind of how he envisions this impacting other areas that affect children and families. But I wouldn't hold our breath on that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Just to be clear. Yeah. And because that's, you know, that's getting into the their internal systems. Right. right. Um, and how this how far this can go. What he can control right now is the child protection <clears throat> area. Who's the juvenile? Of Julia Otsai. Oh, yeah, The parent attorneys are um, what group? What, what, who are they? Is it a specialty? So, I, yes, it is a specialty. I believe that they have a contract with the Washtenaw mm -hmm. County Trial Court to represent parents within the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's an identified group of attorneys, and they yeah, I don't know what that contract process looks like, but since we've been involved with it, I think it's we had one group and now a second group has that contract. And they, they're required to get training every mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They have like family law attorneys, or they 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 not, sort of spe specialize in. You've been some. I mean, when you have yeah, some of those attorneys, yeah, yeah, at least one of those attorneys in that circle is a parent oh, attorney. Okay. Yep, so their their focus is, um, as you were saying, child protection law, and they represent the parents within child welfare proceedings. From your knowledge of them, would you expect them to be enthusiastic about this? I would hope so, because I think it would definitely um, benefit their clients to be involved in something like this, and it would just open, as I said, greater access to services that will help their clients and hopefully um, increase their chances of being reunified with their children. I may have missed this, but started off talking about trauma. Yes. And then shifted into you know, this uh, new program. Mm -hmm. I just, where is this going to treat the trauma? So, okay, that's a good question. Or is it going to be, or is that not part of the system? It is part of it. So in the current child welfare system, when a parent, when a family enters the child welfare system, DHHS is tasked with composing an individualized <coughs> service plan for the family. And part of that service plan is that they identify um, services such as therapy, parenting classes, substance abuse treatment for the parents involved so that they can um, kind of overcome the issues that led them to being involved in the child welfare system in the first place. And so in our program, the services team will connect parents to these types of services that will directly address their trauma. Um, and where our thought is only by addressing that underlying trauma, will parents be able to overcome um, what's led their children to be removed from their care? Because oftentimes, um, for example, in a case where there is a lot of substance abuse, sometimes that's because they have experienced a lot of complex trauma, and that's their way of kind of coping with that trauma. And so rather than kind of seeing the surface issues, we're kind of going deeper into the causes behind, behind that, and, and looking for services that will address those underlying issues. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, and, uh, and, and linking them up with services, <coughs> uh, with the, of the VA, right. that's been right. spotting. Right. Uh, but it, it's, well, it's a lifetime. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. So who would pay for, like, mental therapists, that sort of thing? Are they trying to find the pro bono ones, so to speak? Or is, is there money available to pay them? Yeah, usually, um, from my understanding, under the current system, it's usually paid for through Medicaid, or DHHS will pay for the services. So even right now, there you know these parents get into the system. They go see a therapist. They have some sort of person evaluates them. They have a therapist, and they have a this, and they have a that. Those services are being paid for. The feedback has been that the service provider just uses a boilerplate approach for every every person who comes through the door. One example about parenting classes, so a parent wasn't parented well, therefore it's not parenting well. 
So you send a parent of a teenager to a parenting class and that service provider's class talks about the engagement of infants. Um, so you have parents saying, my kids are teenagers and not in diapers. Why am I being forced to go to a class where they're teaching me how to diaper the baby? That's not where I am in my, I need the skills to deal with the child at this stage of life and you know, and what, you know, and all, and, and there could be some trauma with that in, right. in that parent's life as well. So it's not, you know, so I think the success of this has a lot to do with every person who touches this docket in whatever capacity having the um, acknowledgement that we have to be flexible too. So we have to really kind of step outside our norm of how it always goes and really think as an individual, think of this parent or this family as a unique and individual group that needs this kind of service plan. And that, and that doesn't happen normally. And I, and I, you know, like I said, I'm, I am a bit of an agitator um, with DHHS and I'm kind of proud of that because when they have this parent, the service plan, work plan for it, they, use, they just cut and paste. And I've had caseworkers to say, well, they just kind of use the same language. They use the same service providers. They use the same approach. They use the same, this because it's easier. Um, so this is going to challenge yeah. all of that. Yeah, that sounds like the weak link. Hmm? That sounds like the weakest link hmm. because this is nicely structured and you have the same people involved. But now you're going outside of this to access other resources. Mm -hmm. And especially if the resources are going to be the same resources mm -hmm. that have been used. So that, that'll be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's a challenge. But I also wonder if there are other there are resources who've never been on the radar mm -hmm. of the court or DHHS. Quick example. Um, some of you know that I've been sort of trying to get some things moving at Ypsilanti Middle School, right? Mm -hmm. And have I've had several conversations with them. And the biggest issue they have right now is that the teachers have no trauma information. So they're dealing with kids uh, that they want to suspend all the time. And we're beginning to shift the conversation a tad bit to talk about their trauma, being trauma informed, just understanding the triggers and how to do that kind of stuff. I don't know either. So whatever comes, if whatever training comes out of this, we want to be a part of that too. So I, I put that on the table. And who in this area does, you know, who do you, what is the resource? And I found two at the, uh, connected with the University of Michigan. But they're not in the DHHS pool, but they're people who are experts in trauma, who do workshops, who you know, yeah, who do this kind of work. A friend of mine is getting trained as a trauma, yeah. something or other. But but they're not on <laughs> that vendor list, which is what it is, a vendor list. I need a vendor who does this. They go to the vendor list. The vendor pops up. Their contract is good. Their numbers are good or whatever, and they get the contract. You know, it's so there are a lot of res I think there are a lot of resources here that have not been tapped for whatever reason, but may be very appropriate for this. But it takes all of that building that, that I, you know, and I'm not, yeah, I don't know how that works, but it'll take a lot of work on that um, to bring those folks to the forefront. And, I'm, and I feel hopeful that people will want to be involved. Right. One of the goals is everybody wants to get involved and how many people are really qualified. Yeah, how do you screen that and, and determine? Biggest resource we found were the veterans. Mm -hmm. we got yeah, wow. Together. How about that? And they would talk to each other. And that was unusual people's notion of will not talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. But they'll talk Same to each other mm -hmm. because they feel there's no judgment. That they mm -hmm. Well, that's been the success of the parent mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. The parent partner success yeah. has been that okay. in and of itself. Mm -hmm. The parent partners were parents who have been through this system reunified with their kids and had some length of time of reunification, got the job as a parent partner. The parents that they work with, their caseload, 
those parents talk and confide with them at a much higher rate than they do their attorneys and, and, uh, and the other folks. And that makes sense. I mean, it does make sense. But they are able to be that buffer to get them to engage in, you know, whatever processes and services better. Mm -hmm. It's the parent partner. That's a perfect example, too, of if we have a parent who has complex trauma, maybe not necessarily from adverse childhood experiences, but it's because they are a veteran, then we, the resiliency court manager's task is to find service providers that are specifically, can specifically connect with veterans and understand their specific needs. Mm -hmm. so. And the trauma is substance abuse. Um, the training part of parenting is not necessarily the issue. Right. Uh, what kind of resources do we have to, to, to order, to order, let's say, uh, in, in care someplace for substance abuse? Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you do with, uh, as long as the substance abuse issue hasn't been resolved yet, how do they participate in this program? Uh, now that it's not a crime to be a victim of that type of, of trauma, mm -hmm. we don't lock up substance abuse users. Uh, how do they fit into the program? So um, yeah, we do lock them up. <laughs> yes. and they're right over here. Yeah. Some of them yeah. right over here right now. If they're if, if, if they're in the market, yes. But yeah. they're when I'm talking just the street. street yeah. Users. Yep. So an example could be, and this actually happened in a case I was working on. Um, there was the main issue in the case was substance abuse, and we strongly believed it was because there was a lot of unresolved trauma that mm -hmm. led this parent to kind of self-medicate through using substances. And so if she came into our court, first um, they would kind of recognize that her substance use could be rooted in her trying to um, treat or overcome her traumatic experiences. And so they would connect her with therapists and service providers who can directly address their trauma. But then she'd also probably go through substance abuse treatment as well. Mm -hmm. But if we're recognizing that we're not going to completely solve the problem just by treating her substance abuse, we also have to address what's motivating her to use substances. So I have one concern with all the different meetings that, um, mm -hmm. that yep. the clients have to go through. And I remember in a couple interviews I had with women who had been through this, that it's just demand, 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 demand. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can build into part of this ways to support Absolutely. parents so that they can do what's, mm -hmm. what you're asking them to do, right. which could be helpful, but not if they're totally stressed out because they can't eat all this. Right, absolutely. And that's also part of the resiliency court manager's task is to ensure that parents are getting adequate support, um, but also that they're not, for example, being forced to miss work in order to participate or they have adequate transportation. Um, and so that's, we're, we're kind of envisioning the services team um, as the members of this program who are equipping parents to be able to participate, but also, um, I don't know, there aren't any consequences in other areas of their lives for participating. And, and one of the things that we discussed, um, Claire and Sally and I discussed, that some of these meetings have different names, but they're doing the same thing. <laughs> so one, on Monday, you go to your family team meeting. Then on Wednesday, you go to your case conference. Then on Friday, you have your peer support group. The family team meeting, the case conference, could probably do the, it's a, can accomplish the same thing. It probably has the same cast of characters. Um, but the labeling, you know, has uh, how agencies have to label things to document it in the file for compliance, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a real thing. The HHS caseworkers have a compliance officer who look at the case files to make sure things are there and things are labeled well and the timeline is there. Then there may be a supervisor or someone over that compliance officer who does a random sampling of the cases to make sure. So everybody's covering themselves. But one consideration that I have asked is that you look at the context of those meetings and see if we can collapse some and accomplish, you know, because it is. I mean, that's a chronic complaint um, from parents. It's like, I have to go to work. I have to do a drop, meaning drug testing. I have to do my parenting time. I have to, you know, do hours with Michigan Works, whatever. And I have to go to all of these meetings. I don't have a car. Um, and even though it feels like a small geographic area, getting from Ypsilanti to Ann Arbor, many of the service providers are in Ann Arbor, not Ypsilanti, and the bus routes. And it, it gets very, it gets extremely complicated. And burdensome, and the people disengage. Right. They disengage. Yeah, so there's definitely some room for some consolidation. Um, but under our model, the only 
they would just be required to go to the peer support meeting once a week, and then everything else occurs once a month. So we're trying to be as less as the least intrusive as possible into their other commitments. If the suggestion is made for like individual counseling, mm -hmm. which I would, uh, would imagine would be fairly common to yes. address deep, mm -hmm. you know, problems that have been going on right. for a lifetime, is that on top of those things then, and is that something they have to? It's a cost yep. that they have to. That would be part of their service plan. Yeah. Yep. But they would have to get there and pay mm -hmm. for it. Yep. That's oh. that's something Maybe that. Hey, but they have to get there. They won't have to pay for it, but um, but that's something. If there is an issue, the parent partner or the resiliency court manager could provide that transportation for them. So, um, the the um, reunification cases come to the court, and they are then uh, a sap. What takes place is this assessment and, and the model is in place, and that's what happens, right? And so everybody, it's not a choice. Is it a choice for, 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 for the people, for, for the parents to participate? Seems like it should be in the child welfare system or this? No, the resilience. Oh, in court. In, in, say they have to go to court to. Um, so this is what's going to happen. they're going to have, they're going to be part of this resiliency docket. Resiliency docket, or can they say, no, I don't want to be bothered. I don't have I don't have any hope. Um, I'm just going to do what my cousin did and whatever. The or aren't most of the do they have courts a I think most of the specialty courts are voluntary. I think usually if there's like a drug treatment court, since that's typically very intense, those are usually voluntary. Um, I guess we could, we, we have considered making our hours voluntary as well, um, but they're going to have to go through but the court process point, either way. it's not a voluntary. I mean, I, I would think if this is a given, this is what's going to happen. And so, I mean, because otherwise, if it's a Pilot, how do you know where's the efficacy? If if, pe mm -hmm. if people have a choice of signing up or not, um, where this is being proposed as a positive step forward, um, why not? So are you asking? Are you suggesting that it should be mandated that mm -hmm. the, a case comes into the court under child protection? It should be. That they go mm -hmm. if, they have a, if they have a score of eight. If they have a score of eight. Yeah, something about that. I mean, yeah. certainly, I think maybe, Phyllis, you're getting at this. If you want true understanding about how effective it is, you've got to get people who are resistant and people who really are owning it and everybody in between mm -hmm. to, to really kind of know the effects. Right. Um, and we otherwise, you just know the people who really want to get who get on board, mm -hmm. and they're your. But you know that's worth something. I'm just saying, yeah. if you really want. To yeah, and we I didn't discuss it, but we do have an, a, a full evaluation plan is, that we. Is inadvertent is is that parent a singular thing or are ever their parents <laughs> parents attorneys? I think I believe a parent can choose whether to share an attorney or to have separate attorneys if there is a couple that's within the child welfare system. There are some cases where both parents are yeah, are involved in it, but in our experience, the parents have been represented by separate attorneys so far. Yeah, each parent has their own attorney. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, this is pretty ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. So, are you going to get data from this after your pilot program, and then what's going to happen then? So, we do, as I was saying, we do have an evaluation plan. So, we will be able to assess whether this is actually helping people within the program. And also, we are hoping to collect data. This is kind of um, something that's been on the back of our minds at, at University of Michigan is kind of collecting data on the ACE scores that parents have within the child welfare system. Um, but if it does prove effective, that will allow us to get more funding to make this more of a permanent fixture. And then 
we'll have to see how Judge Connors has to <coughs> expand it from there. Are you going to remember us here in Washtenaw County when you get that job offer in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually I'm going to Colorado, so but, yeah. yeah. But I am hoping I would love to take this with me, and I think the other people on our team too want to take this with them wherever they go. So what so. happens when your team leaves? So we're actually in the process of finding younger students who are interested in participating in this, and we're hoping to transition that to them this semester, so we that can be kind of ongoing once we graduate. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for listening. Oh, I'm going to Denver. Oh, really? Belinda, you're going to tell us when, when the circle starts. Um, so the next step for us, uh, as she said in the presentation, is that they were looking for funding. Um, so that seems to be a big piece. And how big of a piece that is, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's a deal breaker or not. I haven't heard of you know either way. So let's assume that the Supreme Court will support it and will give them the funding that they need, um, then that's needed for the project, then I, I'm assuming that the partners will be brought together to talk about our function. What I have asked for is that <coughs> we participate with the case, as facilitators of the case conferences, we still do peacemaking when, when needed and appropriate, and that any training that this project gets, like the traumas, um, specifically the trauma training that we are a part of that so we want to be in on the ground uh, on the front end as things are emerging and of course I'll keep everyone involved uh, informed of how this goes but I have no idea and no control over how the Supreme Court will operate I think there's been highly favored in at that level at the scale um, people are interested in it but I'm sure the dilemma is how do we pay for it if, as usual yeah. yeah and that's we're currently looking yeah. for grant and private foundation funding to yeah. fund this project and, and yeah. I would say with that part and I'm not again I'm not a part of that I don't know where they're going but I'm hearing from other places they're piloting and getting started with like Casey Foundation funds there's some private dollars there's some private dollars out there foundation dollars where the giving philosophy is to uh, really change the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. They want to only fund projects that gives that kind of change. <coughs> so I feel hopeful. I think this is one of those. Yeah. Yeah. So it's training for both facilitating a case conference mm -hmm. and trauma. Mm -hmm. yep. That's what well, volunteers I, would need to do. I, no, I don't think you need training mm -hmm. on facilitating. I think maybe some, process, you know. Right. Well, it's, it's not the circle process. We're facilitating a meeting. Yeah, yeah. which so is so not think, running a circle, right? That is correct, but yeah. I'm not sure that we need to have you know, a paid trainer for that. That's something we might be able to handle internally mm -hmm. for those of us who feel we need, you know, how to facilitate. Can we yeah, have I don't, on that? Yeah, I don't yeah. know about how to facilitate a large group external, but it mm -hmm. just seems to me that it probably has to be a fairly structured facilitation. Yeah, you have to know how to facilitate a group, a large group. <laughs> and there are very unique skills uh, in facilitation. But the trauma and all that stuff, which, um, you know, that would be probably new to, to many of us and definitely new to the DRC. So, yeah. I don't know if anybody's interested, but uh, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts has their annual meeting in Washington, D.C. this June, mm -hmm. and the theme of the whole conference is trauma. Yeah, wow. oh, uh, wow. yeah so it's a hot topic right now. So, yeah, so. yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's like, why didn't we think of that? I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a synonym for the old problem. Yeah, I guess with that, yeah, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? No, it's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that you all are excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. And um, I wish I re could remember what next brown bag is. <laughs> it is in March. Oh, Doug Van Epps will be here. I should remember that because oh. I had to. Mm -hmm. Doug Van Epps is the director of the Office of Dispute Resolution at the State Court Administrative Office. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that we report to. He's going to come for next month's brown bag, which I think is March 7th, and his topics will be about trends and mediation. Uh, he's going to talk about online mediation, which is an important subject to him. 
uh, interesting doing um, virtual mediation. How does it work? I think he wants to pilot something maybe this year, early next year. Um, and other, um, you know, pertinent things coming from the state level. So he's going to be here to share that with us next month. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you very much.